In this video, I'm going to discuss the divergence theorem and its applications in physics. So the divergence theorem is a very useful uh, theorem in multivariate calculus. So it's often introduced in multivariate calculus when you're dealing with calculus of vectors. So vector calculus is a common field which this is used in. So this is an area of mathematics that deals with three-dimensional or even higher dimensional vectors and how they change over time. So we're doing things like derivatives and uh, Bell operators with vectors and we're also doing things like integrals. Not just simple line integrals but also surface integrals and volume integrals. These are all ideas in vector calculus. So what are we going to do in this video? Well, we're going to talk about this specific theorem. And it's stated over here. It is diver the divergence theorem, or sometimes it's known as Gauss's theorem as well, because Gauss helped with a lot of these ideas and developing them historically. So what is this saying, uh, all this mathematics, what is it actually saying? Well, this left expression over here is a volume integral. You can see it's a triple integral there we're integrating across three spatial dimensions. If we were to use Cartesian coordinates, it would be x, y, and z. So we would turn this dv into dx, dy, dz. If it was in cylindrical coordinates, then we'd have some kind of z axis, like a vertical axis. We would have some kind of radial distance away from that vertical axis. And we would also have an angle, which we can call theta, which would tell us the final coordinate, final spatial coordinate. We could also do this in spherical coordinates, and we would have a radial distance away from a center and two angles, theta and phi, as they're commonly called. So depending on which uh, parameterization we use of a volume, we would use different coordinate systems. Some coordinate systems are more convenient depending on the symmetries inherent in the system that you're trying to describe. So if you have something that has cylindrical symmetry, maybe like a wire or some kind of column, then you would use cylindrical coordinates. If you have spherical symmetry, like some kind of, I guess a planet or a sphere, that kind of system, then you would use spherical coordinates. And if, if you don't have that kind of symmetry, well then Cartesian coordinates are often very easy to work with. Because you're just looking at your traditional x, y, and z coordinates. So that's how you would parameterize this. You would need three values to parameterize a volume. And that is actually how you would compute a volume integral. But what is inside this integrand? What is the integrand of this integral? Well, it is the divergence of a vector field. F over here is a vector field. You can see it has an arrow above that denotes a vector quantity. So a vector field is this mathematical object or this mathematical idea that describes every single point in space with a, you can think of it as an arrow. So every point in space is actually assigned a magnitude and a direction. So you can imagine these little arrows sitting in, in three-dimensional space. Every single point has an arrow. And every, every one of these arrows actually defines some kind of flow, a flow, a vector field of a flow. So that's useful for a lot of applications, which we'll see in a moment. Uh, what's over here on the right-hand side? Well, we have two different forms of a surface integral over a surface S. So over here we have a volume integral over V, and here we have a surface integral over S. Now this is a closed surface. That's what this little sign on the, on the double integral says. It's a closed surface. Now to parameterize a surface, you need two variables because it's two-dimensional. Even though it lives in 3D space, it's some kind of surface in 3D space, but it's a two-dimensional surface. So this guy over here, this N, is actually a normal vector. And it normal means perpendicular to the surface. So if you imagine every single point on the surface is going to have a vector that is perpendicular to the plane of the surface. And that's what we're doing over here. We're actually taking the dot product of the vector field and the normal vector. And this is just an equivalent notation. These are just two different notations for the equivalent thing. This is a surface integral of the vector field, and this is a volume integral. So that is what the divergence theorem is actually stating. It says, this volume integral of the divergence is equivalent to a surface integral of the vector field. Or in other words, the surface integral is the net flux. The net flux through a closed surface is exactly the same as the volume integral of all of the divergence. Because divergence 
what is actually diver divergence is how things come out of a point, right? That's what divergence is describing. Divergence tells us if we were to look at a point, how does a vector field emerge from that point? Or how does it go into the point? If divergence is zero, well then you're not gonna have any flow in or out. If it's positive, things are coming out. If it's negative, things are going in. So I can write that down as a few conditions. So for, first of all, uh, let's, have, let's have a look at what divergence actually is. So divergence, if we write it down, this is the del operator, sometimes known as nabla. We take the divergence of this guy, well, that's going to be the same as taking the dot product of these two guys. But what is a dot product? Well, a dot product, if we have two vectors, uh, a, so this is a dot b, well, that's just going to be the same as a x comma a y comma a z. And we're going to dot that with b x, b y, and b z. So these are the x, y, and z components of the vectors a and b. And if we were to take the dot product, well that's the sum of well, all the multiples, if we multiply each of the respective components and then we add them all together. That sum, that is the dot product. So we're gonna have ax, bx, plus ay, by, plus az, and bz. Right, so the, these are both the x components, we're multiplying them together. These are the y components, we're multiplying them. And then these are the z components, and we're also multiplying them together. And when we multiply them together, we take the sum of all of these guys. And this generalizes to higher dimensions, right? This, this can work even if you have four or five or 10 components. As long as you multiply each of the components together, and then you take the sum of all of these uh, products, that's gonna be your dot product. But now, we're gonna take the dot product of this crazy looking operator. Now this guy is the del operator. And what does the del operator actually look like? Well, it looks like this. It's got partial derivatives, d dx, d dy, and d dz. These little commas over here to separate. So the, the three components are d dx, d dy, d dz. So all of these, uh, operations I'm doing here are in Cartesian coordinates. That's x, y, and z. Uh, you can actually do all of these operations in cylindrical and spherical coordinate systems as well. It's just the, the nuances here are a little bit different. You're gonna have different factors out the front and inside. Uh, keep in mind, we're also using this curvy d because these are partial derivatives. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna dot that with fx, fy, that's a y, and f, z. Ooh, I'll write that a bit better. I'll write that as z. So this over here, this is our definition of the dot product that we're using, the Cartesian coordinate system as well. So this is fx, fy, and fz. And we're gonna multiply these guys by the partial derivatives, and then we're gonna sum everything together. And what's that gonna give us? That's gonna give us d, fx, dx, and then we're gonna to add to that dfy, dy, and finally dfz, dz. And I'm just gonna make this z look a little bit better, maybe this y as well. So th this little subscript notation is just saying this is the x, y, and z components of the vector f. So f has a value at every single point. So f of x, f of y, and fz could have completely different values depending on where you are in 3D space. But this value is gonna be unique, possibly, for every single point. So this divergence can be computed for every single point in three-dimensional space. All you have to do is take the three components, differentiate them, partially differentiate them with respect to their uh, respective components, right? X goes with X, Y goes with Y, Z goes with Z. If you do that and you take the sum, you'll get the divergence. Then, once you have the divergence, what you can do is you put that divergence inside here and you take the volume integral of that divergence. 
And it turns out that's equivalent to the surface integral. So how would you go about computing these things? Well, first of all, you'd find an expression for the components of this vector field f. Then you would uh, take the partial derivative with respect to each of the, the variables x, y, and z. You would take the sum of all those partial derivatives. And then you would take the triple integral. If you're using x, y, and z, you would go dx, dy, dz. Right? And you'd have the triple integral of that. And that would give you all of the flux coming out. Right? How, do we know, um, how do we know that it's all the flux? Well, we know it's all the flux because the divergence theorem says that the flux with the surface integral through a surface s that encloses the volume, that is equivalent to this expression. So we can compute that side if that side is easier to compute. Or we could compute this side if this side is easier to compute. How would we compute this? Well, what we would do is we take the dot product. Uh, we, again, we would need fx, fy, and fc. We take the dot product of that with the normal vector. And for that, we would actually need a parameterization of the surface. So we need two variables for that. And then once we have this dot product, we take the integral over the entire surface. So I'll draw a little diagram to illustrate what I'm trying to say here. So I'm going to a different color. And what we can actually do is we can, I'll draw it over here. If we have some kind of surface, this could be any kind of surface. And I'll draw us little contours to say, OK, this is a 3D surface. It could be some kind of odd looking potato sort of surface. This is some kind of potato or maybe a peanut. And it has contours. And it's, it's, not, it's not a completely uh, flat surface. But it doesn't have to be. All it has to be is an enclosed, roughly smooth surface. So uh, what can we do with this surface? Well, what we can do is we can have two different ways to find the flux coming out of the surface. We could take this approach. We could take the surface integral. So what's s? s is this surface. right? And what's the inside? The inside is v. right? That's v. And that's s. So s is the boundary of v, where the surface s is the boundary surface of the volume v. That's what we have in this diagram. So if we took all of the divergence coming out of every little point inside here, so imagine every point is, is producing something. Things are coming out of every single point, where they could be going in, going out. That, that could be happening at every single point. And then we add all of that up. We sum that up. And what's the limit of a sum? Well, it's an integral. And because we're doing it in three dimensions, we're doing it over a volume, we're going to have a triple integral or a volume integral over v. And that's going to tell us all of, all of the stuff that's coming out of this uh, volume over here. But everything that comes out has to pass through the surface, through the surface s. So if it's coming out or if it's going in to this volume, it has to go through this boundary surface. There's no other way. It can't just appear and disappear. It has to go through the boundary. So you can think of it as uh, things have, if a plane has to fly into a country, it has to go over a border. It has to pass the border of the country. Right? It can't just pop into, it can't teleport into a country all of a sudden. So it has to go through the boundary. So how can we think of that? Well, we can think of each point on this boundary as a normal vector. That's n with a little hat. That's this notation, n hat. This is a normal vector. So it has unit length, so its magnitude is 1, but it points in a certain direction. And that direction is always normal to the surface. So if this is a surface, this is perpendicular to the surface. And every uh, normal vector is going to be perpendicular to the surface. So you can follow this surface around, and you'll get something that's perpendicular. Right? So that's what this is. And every point over here is also going to have a value of f. So this vector field f could be pointing in that direction. And over here, we could have the normal vector pointing down this way. Again, it's got a, a normal, it's normalized, so it's got a length of 1. So it's pointing down. And if you think about it, this could have a vector pointing in. right? f could be pointing in. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the dot product of these two guys. How do we take the dot product? Well, we do this little computation over here if we're working in Cartesian coordinates. So if we were to do that, we take the dot product of the vector field f with the normal vector. And we were to add all of that up 
uh, for every single point on the surface, that would give us the surface integral and it would give us the total flux. So what would that look like? So I'll, I'll draw another little general surface. So if you have some kind of surface, if you have things flowing out of the surface, like this, so this is flowing out of the surface, and you have some things flowing into the surface like that, the surface integral is going to be the net. The net flow in and the net flow out. All of that, if you sum it together, it's going to be the net flow. And another way of finding that value is looking at the divergence, finding the divergence, and then integrating the divergence. Because every little point here is going to have some kind of flow in or flow out. Now, if let's, let's have a look at some of the conditions. If the divergence is 0, what does that mean? That means there's no net flow in or out of a point. Right? If it's 0, nothing's flowing in, nothing's flowing out. But what, I'll, so I'll write that condition, that's nothing. What if the divergence is positive? If the divergence is positive, that's coming out, flow out. And you can probably guess, if the divergence is negative, less than 0, it's going in. Right? So if it's 0, there's nothing coming in and out. Or you can think of it as the same amount of stuff that's going in is also coming out. So it's equivalent. Everything that goes in must come out. That's this case. If it's positive, then stuff is coming out of a point. And if it's negative, stuff is going into a point. So let's think of some real world applications in physics. How would we apply Gauss's theorem? Well, first of all, electromagnetism uses this all the time. Maxwell's equations use this all the time. In fact, the first two of Maxwell's equations are called Gauss's law and Gauss's law for magnetism. Right? So they describe electric and magnetic fields using this theorem. And this theorem is actually invoked to convert between the integral and the differential form of Gauss's law for electric fields and Gauss's law for magnetism. So this is a very important uh, theorem that's used in electrodynamics and electromagnetism uh, in the classical sense. So uh, why is it used? It's because you have a vector field, an electric field or a magnetic field, and that's describing some kind of physical phenomena. So we need to invoke this theorem to simplify our calculations. Sometimes it's easier to find a surface integral. Sometimes it's easier to find a volume integral of the divergence. If we can easily compute the divergence and then take the volume integral, then we can do that and set that equal to this. If it's really difficult to find that uh, and it's a lot easier to find the surface integral, then we can do this and set that equal to that. So there's two different approaches when you're trying to actually compute this. So we've talked about electromagnetism as a possible application. There's also fluid mechanics. So uh, finding solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, finding even deriving Bernoulli's equation for fluid flow. Uh, that can all have the divergence theorem embedded in it, right? Because the divergence theorem is talking about things flowing in and flowing out. That perfectly matches with our description of fluids, or a classical description of fluids. You have things flowing in and you have things flowing out. And you're looking at surfaces. You're looking at volumes, right? Uh, many other applications exist for this kind of uh, stuff. Anytime you're describing something that's flowing in or coming out, or anytime you're describing something in 3D space where there's directions and flows across a boundary, right? You can even think of it as uh, bees flying around or birds flying around. These are all possible systems that you could describe with vector calculus. And anything that invokes vector calculus is probably going to invoke the divergence theorem, because divergence is an essential quantity. So that's some of our applications. What have we talked about in this video? In summary, we have discussed the divergence theorem. The divergence theorem says, if you take the divergence and then you take the volume integral of that divergence, that's the same as taking the surface integral. Again, this is for a vector field. In this case, the vector field is f. And we've also talked about what divergence is, how to compute divergence, what the dot product is, how to compute the dot product, and we've also talked about what happens with divergence. What, what happens when divergence is 0, when it's positive, or when it's negative.
and we've looked at some physical, intuitive explanations as to what's going on with divergence and the divergence theorem for enclosed surfaces that are, form boundaries for volume.